Welcome to the HEAL podcast for all things related to Lyme disease and other chronic illnesses. I'm Mimi McLean, Mama Five, founder of Lyme 360 and a Lyme warrior. Tune in each week to hear from doctors, health practitioners, and experts to hear about their treatments, struggles, and triumphs to help you on your healing journey. I'm here to heal with you. Hi, welcome back to the HEAL podcast. This is Mimi, and today we have Dr. Casey Kelly. She is a board-certified and family medicine doctor, as well as an integrative medicine doctor. She has studied the causes, effects, and treatments of Lyme disease extensively and lectures nationally on this and other topics. Today, Dr. Kelly runs her own practice, Case Integrative Health, in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to talk to you because you are a doctor that is treating Lyme patients, but also have had Lyme. And I think that's kind of hard to find because you can relate and it's really hard to find a doctor that can relate to you. I mean, I'm going through that now where I have a wonderful doctor and I'm having a flare up and I just feel like I'm at my wit's end. And I think he's like, I don't even know what to do with you anymore. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Anyway, I'm glad that you're on today because I'd love for you to talk about your personal experience with Lyme. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's true. It gives me a little bit of a, an extra empathetic edge, if you will, having kind of gone through it, you know, everybody's experience is so unique Mm -hmm. with Lyme. And I think that's part of why it's so tricky, right. And hard to treat is because everybody is so different, but I can at least go, yeah, I've been there, you know, done that. I know exactly what you're going through right now. So I do think that that kind of gives me an interesting take on patient care and can kind of help people. But my story is not all that different than so many other people's story. I was sick for a long time, started in college, started with fatigue issues, could no longer be super active like I was in high school, trouble breathing, brain fog, got diagnosed with asthma. Newsflash, that's not what it is. (laughs) Yeah. Now, how did you get through school though? Like there's actual school work. Yeah. Actually med school is where it really hit me. And I don't know how I got through it. I just, I don't know. (laughs) I guess I'm stronger than I, than I think I am. I just kind of barreled through it, but it was pretty miserable. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what exactly. I knew I was more tired than my peers and everybody was tired, right? We were doing, you know, 30 hour shifts, right? And then you have to go home and study and, you know, all this nonsense. But I got diagnosed with POTS when I was in med school. I had to do the tilt table study and all that kind of fun stuff. Could you do me a favor and just tell people what POTS is? Because I haven't had anybody talk about that yet. Absolutely. Yeah. POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's a dysautonomia issue. So it's an autonomic nervous system problem. And when you stand up, your body is supposed to regulate all of that gravity shifts and things really quickly. So you don't notice But in POTS, you do notice. You get really dizzy and lightheaded. Your heart rate starts ramping up. You can pass out. It's very fatiguing in and of itself. You kind of feel like you're just running a marathon by standing. And I definitely almost passed out during a surgery when I was a med student. All these issues that you can have. And it's super common with tick-borne infections. Lyme and Bartonella especially seem to be culprits for it. But it can be very, very scary and challenging and exhausting in and of itself. So got diagnosed with that in med school, tried different medications and treatments for it. It sort of helped, but they were band-aids. You know, they weren't actually Mm -hmm. fixing the problem. You know, I made my way all the way through residency and and med med school and residency and just kind of suffered through some of that stuff until afterwards when I finally was able to kind of get some more integrative medicine care. And from my own research, as well as seeing an integrative physician and getting some adrenal fatigue taken care of, some gut stuff taken care of. And then along the way, got myself (laughs) diagnosed with Lyme. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I, you know, kind of all, it all fits together in hindsight when you sit there and go, oh, oh, okay. Well, that explains everything. (laughs) Why, when you got the pots, like, why wouldn't that set off a red flag for people like, Hey, maybe it's Lyme too. You would think, but it's, I don't think it's all that commonly known that it's a big cause of pots. Pots is still largely misunderstood in and of itself. So when I was going through the diagnosis, there was only a couple places in the country really that knew much about it. And so it's right. kind of hard to find information on it to begin with. Mm-hmm. And it was largely just believed to be idiopathic, which means we don't know. 
we don't know why you have this. So we just treat the symptoms because there's no cause that we can find. And so it's been linked more and more to different infections over the years. So I think people do look for that, but Lyme is still so misunderstood that a typical conventional, either neurologist or cardiologist who's going to diagnose the POTS isn't going to look for Lyme. So. You know, what amazes me that you got through medical school with memorizing, like just the memory part, like the brain yeah. fog part. Like I, I can't remember. I used to be able to remember everything. I don't remember conversations anymore. I, it, it's so hard for me to have any memory and medical school. I, I, I always wanted to be a doctor. And I remember I took my first biology class and I was like, forget, or no, it was an anatomy class. And you had to memorize like every piece of the body and every word. And I was like, there is no way, like, I can't imagine being able to memorize all that having Lyme. Yeah. Yeah. Med school was hard. Med school is really hard. It's a, and it's the amount of information that's coming at you is more like a fire hose instead of a garden hose. Mm -hmm. And I never had that much, you know, information all at once either. I went through some neuropsych testing actually, and was diagnosed with ADD, but I never took any medications. They didn't really offer them. I didn't really think that that was the issue, but I was having a really hard time, really hard time. And you um, became an MD, yeah. right? Not an ND. And yes, medical doctor. So when you graduated, you're an MD, you think you're going to go to the conventional route, right? I'm sure that was in the cards. You probably didn't start medical school thinking, oh, I'm going to become a natural, like dealing with Lyme. So yeah, once I got to residency, I started to really dig into why people are sick. You know, the conventional paradigm in my training was find a diagnosis and then give them a medicine, but it was never really, why are they sick? And I'm a family medicine doc, so I'm a general practitioner. So we kind of deal with everything. And there was a lot of give them this medicine. And when they get a side effect, give them that medicine. And then, you know, you just kind of pile on and no one's actually going, why, why are they sick? Even with things like diabetes, like why are we not asking about their diet? Why are we not doing this more? And I, I think we are more over the years, but, um, I just was really disheartened with all of that. And I knew there was more to it. So I really got into some more holistic medicine association conferences and started educating myself into the functional medicine world and knew I found my home. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I did a year of urgent care after residency, but that's really the only conventional medicine that I've practiced. I went right into integrative medicine after that. And I knew that that why I needed to dig in and find that why. And I think that's partly how I ended up with the line thing too, is finding out why, 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 why there's got to be something else. We've got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. And so can you talk a little bit about your practice now? I mean, are you focusing mostly on Lyme or do you, are you still a family practice where you treat many different you know, illnesses? Yeah, no, actually I have my own practice. So I started case integrative health in 2019 and I deal with mostly chronic complex illnesses, like mostly Lyme and other tick-borne infections, but that also kind of parlays into mold mast cell dysfunction, chronic fatigue, ME, all of that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, people find me who've been sick for a long time, who don't have any answers and they know they don't feel well, but conventional medicine is just kind of saying, <laughs> it's all in your head, kind of go to your psychiatrist, right? Unfortunately, I hear that a lot. That's kind of my mainstay, but the practice as a whole is not necessarily that. We do a lot of conventional, not conventional, standard, I guess, functional medicine workup. So more gut healing, autoimmune. We have a neurologist on staff as well and a PA. And so we can deal with a lot of different medical issues. And because I'm a family doc, I can also see kids and adults. So we get kind of the whole foray, but we don't really do primary care. We do more, more complex treatments and workups. So if you have somebody who comes to you who I assume at that point, they kind of know they already have Lyme and they've been sick or no, they don't even know they have Not always. Not always. We, I mean, I do have a fair amount of people who find me because they got a Lyme diagnosis. And so they want to come talk to me because I have that Lyme expertise. But we also have people that come to us who just don't feel well and they haven't felt well for a while and they want to know why. And so we'll, we'll diagnose Lyme that way too, sometimes, because that may be what their issue is. And they may not have known that to begin with. So we see that sometimes. So if someone comes to you as Lyme, what is typically your first standard of care? Like what treatments do you offer? I wish it were that easy. It is very, very individualized. Typically my first visit is 90 minutes. And that really gives me a chance to dig in and get the history and really figure out what all is happening and what's underlying 
the issues. And there's usually more than one, right? There's usually fatigue, joint pain, brain fog, digestive issues, you know, all these different things. And it takes a while to kind of unwrap that. So we spend a fair amount of time going through all of that, looking through old labs if they have them, et cetera. I do more labs the first visit if I need to. And we've got regular labs as well as different functional medicine labs that we can do. And it really, though, the treatments are very, very individualized. So it really depends on the person, what they've got going on, what their symptoms are, what I think is it Lyme, is it Babesia, is it mold? So unfortunately, I can't just say, this is typically what we do. I don't think you can treat these tick-borne infections with particular protocols. I think they're so Mm -hmm. complex. You really have to be able to be flexible. and Totally. And if there are, I mean, there's so many different treatments though out there now. So it's like, do you have any that are like, you know, not everybody, I haven't seen a practice that offers everything from SOT to ozone to like all the whole gamut. Is there any that are your kind of go-tos that you use at your office? If it's IV therapy, if it's stem cell, like, I don't know what, is there any that you have found to be the most useful for your Oh, I wish there were one thing that were like, this always works on everybody and everybody should do it because I just haven't found that to be true. Is, some people do really well on antibiotics. Some people do horrible on antibiotics. Some people do really good on herbs. We have IV therapies. We don't usually do IV antibiotics, but we have IV ozone, NAD, PC, silver. We have different options there. We have peptide therapy. We have hydrogen. And it's usually a con- Agglomeration of all of them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, I think that's kind of maybe part of what sets us apart too, is that it's not, you know, it's not, you come in and that's the treatment you get yeah. with that diagnosis, right? You come in and we really try to figure out, especially, I mean, some of these treatments are expensive. Yeah. Really expensive. So, you know, and I, I really want to make sure that that's the right treatment for that patient. And of mm-hmm. course I can't predict that hundred percent of the time. But if I have a, you know, if I can kind of go through and figure it out and I'm much more confident that the IVs are going to be a good choice, then, you know, we can make that decision together. What worked for you? What, what got you better? I did it all. I did antibiotics for a while and then I did herbal antibiotics. And then I went and did some IV therapies on myself. I did ozone, silver, glutathione, saunas, PMF, all of that stuff. That's what really, really turned, everything kind of got me a little better, but the IVs are really what really changed my world. And so that was why I really wanted to bring them and offer them to patients. Yeah. And then do you ever relapse now? Do you ever have flare-ups? Uh, you know, it's usually stress-based type stuff. And I've got to a point where I can kind of tell really early on that I need to get, get my life back in order, <laughs> if you will. And I am like, you know, I'm lucky enough to have some access to ozone and things here. So when I need a boost, I can get one. Pretty yeah. easily. And I just think it's a really good reminder on a regular basis that if I don't take care of myself, I can end up in trouble. Mm-hmm. So it's a regular daily basis where I have to be doing stuff to really try to keep myself healthy as possible. Not to say that I don't have, I mean, I have bad days. I have yeah. bad weeks, you know, we all do. Right. But I have found enough ways at this point to kind of pick myself back up rather quickly, thankfully. Mm-hmm. that I haven't had any major, major relapses. Can you talk a little bit about your ozone? I've done ozone therapy. I've done the 10 pass and I've done just the regular ozone, but then I also bought an ozone machine at home where I can do it rectally and also by the ear. And I know obviously doing, you know, I've read a bunch about it where, you know, obviously the 10 pass is supposedly the best. It's like, it's almost similar to having like a stem cell treatment. But I guess, you know, for those who can't, cause it's so expensive to do those, it's, you know, more, you know, economical to buy the machine at home. Like, is it still worth doing, you know, the ear thing or the rectally at home daily? Can you get the same benefit of doing like an IV ozone? I mean, I think the IVs are more potent yeah, for sure, but the at-home support can absolutely keep you better and more stable and kind of keep that going. I think of ozone as an exercise for your cells. And so mm-hmm. it's not something you can just do once. You have to do it on a regular basis, just like going to the gym. You can't go to the gym once and be a beefcake. You got to keep going and building that up. So having those at-home tools can absolutely help keep you going. But I have found that the IVs are much more potent than either of those. Is there a fear of like if you're doing it rectally or through the ear, like having it oxidize your cells? 
ozone doesn't really cause so much oxidative stress just because of the, the size and charge of the particle. That's not really a big concern. I mean, I know it's very generalized, like very specific, I should say, per patient, but like if someone, I get this a lot, people asking me where they're just diagnosed, they're either waiting a month before they can get into a doctor that's by them, or they don't have the resources because some of these doctors are super expensive to get in. Is there anything at home that they can start doing right away to make them feel, at least put them on the right path to maybe see some improvement? Yeah, absolutely. And diet is kind of the big thing there and detox support. Those would be the two big things. I've had a couple people come in who just eat you know, fast food on a regular basis and drink soda every day. You just, you cannot get better if you are feeding your body crap mm-hmm. food. You just can't. Food is medicine. So you really need to be doing an anti-inflammatory diet. The big three at the very basic level is gluten, dairy, and sugar. Those need to be avoided. You know, we have more complicated diets than that, that we can put people on, but those are the big three and that are going to really suppress your immune system. Especially if you have neurological symptoms, the gluten can be imperative to remove. So starting with the diet, change how you eat, eat the rainbow, eat more veggies, really try to get the goodness from food in your system. And it doesn't have to taste bad. It can still taste really good. If you eat well, use your spices and and enjoy it and, and try to think of it as a an opportunity to learn about different fruits and vegetables instead of focusing on what you can't have, kind of flipping that switch on your approach to it can help a lot with the dietary changes because it's hard to think about every single last morsel you put in your body every single day until it becomes a new habit. The other part then is detox. So supporting your own detox and food helps with that. There's a lot of foods that are very detox supporting like broccoli and cauliflower and garlic and eggs and things that will really help our detox and eliminating the inflammatory foods and the processed foods and that stuff will also help our detox. But most Lyme's have issues with detox, whether it's genetic or just that their system is overloaded and can't handle it. So detox is kind of the second leg of that stool to get started. Right. What do you recommend? I mean, do you recommend coffee enemas or saunas? Like what are your kind of go-to? different things work for different people again. Right. But saunas are awesome, but any kind of sweating is really good. Enemas can be very useful. Coffee enemies, enemas, especially I have people that swear by them. So try it get the right instructions and the right ingredients and, and try it. Epsom salts baths. Mm-hmm. Those are really good or biomats. You can get biomats, Alka-Seltzer gold or bicarb is very neutralizing to the system. Lemon water, castor oil packs. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can do at home that are fairly inexpensive too, to help with detox. What are the castor oil? I actually have never done them. I've read a lot about it. That's probably one of the only things I haven't. I actually bought the kit. I just never kind of got myself. It just seems so complicated. So what, what are the, maybe if I understood what the benefit of it was, more, I would probably read the instructions and try to do it. <laughs> well, they're kind of messy. It's overwhelming yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. You know, it's essentially a piece of flannel that's kind of soaked in the castor oil that you put generally on your liver, but it's also really nice, by the way, on your uterus if you're cramping for mm-hmm. all the ladies out there during your period. But you put it on your liver and then you put a heating pad on it. And it's it's just supposed to be deeper, more penetrating heat. And that's going to help flush out the toxins, open the blood vessels and, and support detox just in general. So it can be lovely and really nice. I've also seen people do it on their neck. If they have a lot of lymph node issues that can really help to drain them or their groin, if they have those issues, you just be careful not to burn yourself and know that it's very messy. So don't do it on nice, clean white sheets. <laughs> I know, right? That's, that's what the things make me nervous. So I see that you also do prolozone therapy. I think I have done that. I just want to make sure once you describe it, if that's what it is. So can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So prolozone is, have you ever heard of just prolotherapy? Yes. Prolotherapy is for, for joints and prolozone kind of piggybacks on that. So the first part, the prolo part is pretty similar. It's prolozone. Typically I will use them for joint pain, trigger point injections, pain, that kind of thing. And there's two parts to the injections. The first part is a bunch of numbing medicine, some B vitamins, dextrose, sometimes a whisper of a steroid, things that like feed the joint essentially. Mm -hmm. And then you follow it with the ozone gas 
And it, just like in your cells, as soon as that ozone gets in there, it's going to turn to oxygen. It's going to stimulate healing. It's going to help lower inflammation and get the cells to start to heal. And mm-hmm. so it's great for joint pain, shoulders, knees, hips, especially if there's a, a, some sort of injury that's mm-hmm. mild, like a rotator cuff injury or something that the prolozone can take care of it right away. But we also use it for trigger point pain too, or just, you know, I have people with chronic low back pain. So we'll do some injections along their back or neck, neck pain and trigger points. It's a very common spot yep, for pain. Yep. It can kind of knock it down really, really quickly and kind of release. I did that a while ago and I forgot about that. I need to do that because right now my flare ups are, you know, I'm, I have my energy. I just literally, my elbow is locked. I can't open my arm and now it moved to my ankle. So I can't walk. It literally freezes. My, my joints are frozen. Like it's the weirdest and most painful thing. Cool. So I forgot about that. I need to call my doctor and ask her to see if she could. That might help. help. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have an extensive array of vitamins on your website and they're very specific. Can you talk about those vitamins that are available and why they're you know different than other vitamins that are out there? Yeah. I'm pretty particular about my supplement companies. I've actually gone to several of the manufacturing facilities to check them out and see mm-hmm. because you know things aren't regulated you know as closely as they could be. So all B12 is not the same, mm-hmm. period, full stop. So I really want to make sure when I'm using these supplements, medications, herbs, whatever they are, that it's something that's going to help the patient. And it's not just, you know, taking a pill to take a pill. So I vetted the companies that I really like and really trust, and I clinically get good results from them. So I'm not just adding more pills for fun. It's, you know, this is going to help you with X, Y, or Z. So that's why I've been very particular about the different websites and things that we use for the herbs or the supplements or whatever it is. So I I don't like Amazon at all. I don't trust that their, their warehouses aren't 150 degrees and are, you know, turning the fish oil to a big oxidative mess, you know? So I really like Zymogen's one of my favorites. Orthomolecular is a great one as well. We use a fair amount of both of those. There's a couple others that I like too. Those are two of my, my big favorites. There are some really good supplement companies out there. There's also some lousy ones. And so you really need to know what you're getting. And all of the stuff, as you mentioned, it's, it's all expensive and it adds up. And some of the, the good stuff is even more expensive, but I'd rather have you spend the money on something I know is going to help you clinically than going to Walgreens and getting something that's not, even though it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. You mentioned it in the beginning of our conversation. I'd love to touch on a little bit more about mold because I really do think that's important. And I think a lot of people, for me, that has been triggers. Like when I have felt better, like that mold has triggered and kind of made me have more flare ups. And so can you talk about what's the best way if you think you've been around mold or you are, you know, you've been around mold to detox from mold? Sure. Mold, typically the best thing to do is binders to bind up the mold. So you want to try to actually get those mold toxins out of your system. So you can quite literally flush them down the toilet. Charcoal is a big one. There's a very particular fiber called OptiFiberLean by Zymogen that works. Mm -hmm. Charcoal, clay, there are some prescriptions as well. And I try to avoid them if I can because they cause a lot of constipation and some liver issues. But saunas are also really good for mold toxins. So sweating on a regular basis also really helps to clear the mold toxins out of your system. Is there anything like nasally you you could be putting in to kind of flush it out? Yeah, sure. And there's a lot of nose issues related to mold too and bacterial overgrowths and whatnot. So, I mean, even just saline rinses can help just kind of flush everything out. There's a couple of different kind of essential oil type blends mm-hmm. that you can use in your nose or your throat. I'll have people kind of use a saline rinse that will put biocidin drops in, which is an, an essential nice. oil blend to flush stuff out. So there's a lot of different kind of tricks and tools. The one thing I've learned over the past month, just from talking to different doctors that I never really kind of addressed is the minerals and like how important, like most of us are depleted in minerals. And I was reading that just yesterday, I came across someone's in my inbox, like people who live in land that does not have a lot of minerals in the, in the ground have a higher percentage of joint pain. And because it's what they're eating, the food, you know, from the, from the, what they're getting. So it's like, I think for me, that's been the part is like my minerals are so low, right? So for people, I think 
and I don't know, is that like, can you say that's a general statement? Like for people who have Lyme, like just start putting a couple drops of minerals in your water. Yeah. I mean, you can't really hurt if you do that. You want to do kind of more of a comprehensive mineral blend though. You don't want to just necessarily pick one or two. You can get like one of those, like has everything kind of. Yeah. Like trace minerals or yeah. Yeah. That actually sometimes in and of itself will just help people feel better if you're replacing it. And I also do recommend things like reverse osmosis water, right? Cause that just removes all the bad stuff, but it also removes all the good stuff from your water. So if you're drinking reverse osmosis water all the time, a good idea to add all those minerals back in because that could be another reason why you're kind of depleted in a lot of these trace minerals that our system needs. Well, this has been amazing. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you would like to touch on? Uh, yeah, there was there, so there's two other things that we do here. And, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it with when you were talking about the ozone. Mm-hmm. We don't do a 10 pass, but we do something that's called a high dose ozone. So it's the equivalent of like an eight to nine pass, wow. but it also has UV light associated with it as well. And so the, the blood goes through UV light on the way out and the way back in. And I have just found over and over again, as well as a part of a national IRB that I was involved in a couple of years ago, that ozone and UV just work better together, period, full stop. Like that's been my clinical experience. That's what I've seen in the research. And so this allows us to do something that's like a 10 pass, but also adds the UV to the mix. Right. So that's our kind of our high dose version. So it's a little different than the 10 pass for sure. Cause the 10 pass kind of, it sucks the blood out and ozonates it and puts it back in 10 times. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this one's a little different because you're on the veins as well, but I get really phenomenal results with it. We also do molecular hydrogen, which is pretty unique. And this is very big in Asia. There's a lot of research in Japan. You can go to a bar in Japan and sit with some hydrogen gas, like a nasal cannula for 10 minutes, <laughs> just kind of like oxygen bars in Colorado and things. Yeah. Molecular hydrogen is really cool. And there's a lot of interesting research behind it. And it's extremely safe. We use a nasal cannula that you just sit and breathe for 30 minutes or so, or sometimes when they're getting certain IVs, we'll add that in a really good for anxiety, sleep. It's really good. Like post-workout, it can reduce headaches. I've seen a Parkinson's patient, her tremor like calmed way down when she was on the hydrogen. It was phenomenal to see is that something you can do at home or you have to go to the office? You could. No, you could do it at home. Absolutely. Yeah. No, their devices are not all that expensive, really, in the grand scheme of things. The hydrogen seeks out cytotoxic radicals and turns them into water. Oh. And so, you know, the biggest side effect is that you feel like you got to pee. <laughs> so it's just a machine and then you have to get you buy hydrogen or what? No, the machine makes the hydrogen. It's a, it's a hydrogen oxygen blend that you end up in, inhaling, but you just use distilled water. And the machine makes it, and then you just sit with a little tube and and breathe normally, and you get some hydrogen. Oh wow! Yeah, it helps. It's instantly soothing and calming, and adds another layer to treatments. And we're gonna start doing hopefully soon some IV hydrogen too, which would be pretty cool. Hydrogenated water, saline water, right? With some hydrogen yeah. in it. So, do you know anything about the SOT? I know very, very little about it. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues about it the other day who swears by it. He's just loving it. So um, I've heard some good things. I've heard mixture. That's why I'm asking. It's really expensive, right? I think so. And yeah, I think it's like 10 grand, but you only go like once a year or once every Mm -hmm. six months or something like that. And then the same thing, the other because I've asked people like, what got you better? And a couple of people have told me that. And then a couple of people told me stem cells. Again, that's an expensive thing, but I don't even know if they're doing it anymore in the United States. So then you've got to go out of the United States, which I'm not sure I want to go out of the United States to do it, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And I just, I I haven't found the research to be solid enough yet to really warrant it. But I do, I also, like I said, I have some colleagues too, like you said, I guess, that have had good results with it, but Mm -hmm. I'm still just waiting on some other research and there's lots of different kinds of stem cells. So you have to, you know, not all stem cells are the same. Yeah. Cause you can get like shark, whatever, or you can get fetus, whatever. And, but then I actually have saved all, I have five children and I saved all of their stem cells. I have all of their stem cells, which was like back then cutting edge, like no one had been doing it. It just started, but I've been told with the research I've had that right now they're not letting you unfreeze them for Lyme. They haven't given that as a permission that you have to have another like disease or something else to use them. Huh. So I don't know. Cause I'm like slow. I've been trying to find out of the way if I can use those to help me. And my daughter also has Lyme, like to help both of us with the stem cells, but we'll see. But anyway, this has been awesome. I really, really appreciate your time. And, um, 
And I think it's going to be really helpful to people who are listening and, you know, who are just going through these different, just trying to get better, right. And see what they can do and get on the other side of it. Yeah. I mean, I think the most important thing is to find a Lyme literate doc who's going to listen, who will be your partner and work through it with you and adjust and adapt because everybody's body is so different that you've got to have someone who's willing to go, okay, that's not working. (laughs) We got to try something else or it's not working enough or whatever, or we've got to find something that may not be Lyme that's underlying this like mold or some other thing. How long did it take you to get better? Oh, that's a great question. Once I started treatment with, from like antibiotics, herbs, IVs, it was probably two years all said and done. But if you add in the prior work with the gut healing and the adrenal work and everything before that, it was probably more like five to eight. Oh, really? Everything all together. And do you drink coffee or drink alcohol? Yes. (laughs) That's good that you're able to, like you probably were not able to when you were in the thick of it. I would assume. Not well. I find like for me, those are triggers. Yeah. It, and it's very common. They're very common triggers. If alcohol is a big trigger, you might want to really look into some mast cell issues because mm-hmm. alcohol breaks down into histamine. And so that's often one of our big problems with being able to deal with alcohol is that we can't handle that extra histamine burden. So that can often be a little warning signal that something like that's happening. But cause I also get massive hives too, which is I think mm-hmm. another mast cell Thing. Like right now I, they're coming on and there's no reason why they should be coming on. Cause I'm sitting here talking to you, but usually it's like cold, um, that makes them come on in the morning. Um, but I've taken so many mast cell like tests. I've taken the blood test of the P test, like done and they keep coming back negative, mm-hmm. but I have like the symptoms. It can be hard because you really have to kind of catch the blood or the urine, like right in the thick of things sometimes yeah. and, or the lab has to freeze things properly. So it's, it's actually pretty hard to get the samples collected properly at the exact right time yeah. to prove mast cell issues. So sometimes you just kind of have to try to treat it empirically and see if it gets better. Right. What ways do you treat that? I usually try to come at it from multiple different angles with antihistamines, with mast cell stabilizers, with diet enzymes. I do feel like there's, I mean, I don't know if you've been following what's going on in the political world of Lyme, but you know, what the um, Stevie and Alex Cohen foundation is doing. And, but it just seems like there's slowly starting to be more awareness in the government and hopefully it will continue on and there'll be more funding. Yeah. yeah. Just because it's crazy how none of this is covered by insurance or recognized by mainstream doctors. Yeah. Yeah. It's mind boggling and frustrating. Yeah. It's funny because I'll have, it's, not, it's actually not funny, but I'll have friends that call and be like, so either I was just diagnosed or my kid was just diagnosed and I'm like, oh, get ready for like, if your child doesn't get better after three weeks of antibiotics, I'm sorry. Like it's, it's a terrible, like, and she's like, yeah. and I made it to her and she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, this is the world. Like they don't believe you. You're not going to be covered by insurance. And if you don't get well after those three weeks of antibiotics, you're kind of on your own. It's such a complicated illness and it's caused by an infection, but it's not really an infectious disease. It's more of a host immune issue. And so that's part of the reason why it's so hard to understand because, you know, you just want to give it an doxycycline and be done. Why doesn't that take care of it? <laughs> and then it just triggers, right? This whole yeah. auto kind of immune and it hides. Yep. It kind of just keeps hiding in different places, which makes it harder to find. But thank you for all that you do and for helping everybody that is sick and and also coming on today and sharing what you know. I know it's really helpful and I really appreciate it and have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you. You too. And and I hope you feel better soon and get to maybe, there's sunshine here in Chicago. So hopefully you get to have some sunshine where you are. And yes, I'm in LA. So it's sunny here. It's good. Oh, perfect. Enjoy. Awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Each week, I will bring you different voices from the wellness community so that they can share how they help their clients heal. You will come away with tips and strategies to help you get your life back. Thank you so much for coming on, and I am so happy you are here. Subscribe now and tune in next week. You can also join our community at Lime360 Warriors on Facebook, and let's heal together. Thank you. Thank you.